So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna um, start off and I'm gonna give you an overview of respiration, okay? So first thing we're gonna look at is um, atmospheric pressure. So if we look at the atmospheric pressure at sea level, it's 760 millimeters of mercury pressure, okay? And so how we get to there is we add up these different gases. We're gonna add up nitrogen, we're gonna add up oxygen, we're gonna add up water, um, we're gonna add up CO2. And when we add all of these up, their pressures actually get us to 760. So for example, if I look at the millimeter, millimeters of mercury of, of nitrogen, I'm looking at P atmospheric, so PATM of nitrogen is about uh, 597.4. Okay, is the P um, of, of nitrogen. Now when I look at the PATM, so ATM stands for atmosphere of oxygen, it's about 158.8, all right? And so what I wanna do is I wanna figure out, well, I also wanna know the percent, okay? Anyway, when I add all these up together, it's gonna to equal 760. Now there's H2O and there's other gases, but O2 and CO2 are the really um, the ones that we wanna concentrate on. Now, if I want to figure out the percent of nitrogen in the air, how could I do that? If I'm, if I'm going, okay, if I want to figure out the percent of nitrogen, how can I figure it out if I know that the total pressure is 760 and I want to figure out the percent if nitrogen makes up 597.4? So I can take 760 divide it into 597, and that's gonna give me a percent of about 78.6%, all right? So then if I take my, um, if I take my oxygen, I'm gonna divide that by 760, and I find that atmospheric oxygen is about 20.9%, okay? And then if I take CO2 and divide that by 760, then that ends up being approximately 0.04%. So most of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. Now, again, this is my P-A-T-M, okay? All right, now let's look at respiration. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to breathe in. So this is my alveoli. Now, when I breathe in, I'm gonna breathe in all of these gases. So now I'm gonna go P, in fact, let me change it to this color. I'm gonna go P, and now I'm gonna do big A. So, by the way, when I'm looking at PATM, that's measured in millimeters of mercury pressure. Oops, I got a person waiting. Okay, so that's measured in millimeters of mercury pressure. So now I'm gonna go P, A stands for alveoli. And so I'm gonna go P, A, O2, all right, and so my PaO2 is about 100, and of course that would be millimeters of mercury pressure. Now I'm gonna take my CO2, and so when I look at my CO2, I'm gonna go PA, big A, because it stands for alveoli, CO2, this is about 40 millimeters of mercury pressure. All right, now I want you to look at something. Out here, I had 158.8 in the atmosphere of oxygen, millimeters of mercury, and I had CO2 at 0 0.3. If you look here, oxygen went to 100 and CO2 went to 40. The question is why? Why did oxygen decrease when it went to the alveoli and O2 increase and CO2 increase? Well, for one thing, oxygen is diffusing into blood, right? So if I look at oxygen in blood, I have P and now I have little a. And little a stands for arterial. My P little a is about 100 
millimeters of mercury pressure of oxygen. So one thing that happened is I went from 158 to 100 because oxygen was diffusing into blood. Now, if I look at my PaCO2, my P little a CO2 is about 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, because these are gonna reach equilibrium. So if you notice here, I reached equilibrium 100, 100, 100, 100. But now look what happens when I come back the other direction. When I come back the other direction, what's taking place is my blood is carrying oxygen. Let me do something here real quick. Okay, so there's my blood. So when I come back around, what I've done is I've given up oxygen to this cell over here. So oxygen is coming off of hemoglobin. So here's oxyhemoglobin. And oxygen is moving into the cell, right? So it would, we would expect that since I'm giving up oxygen, my PVO2, which stands for venous, would be less than 100, and it's about 40 millimeters of mercury. But the other thing I find is that the cell is actually producing CO2. So my PVCO2 is at 45. Now, as CO2 comes back over this way, CO2 is moving into here. And because it's moving into the alveoli from the blood, it's increasing this. So when we think about why is oxygen less in the alveoli than it is in the atmosphere is because oxygen is moving into the blood. And why is CO2 higher in the alveoli than it is in the atmosphere? Because CO2 is moving into the alveoli, all right? Any questions on, th on that stuff so far? Okay, then we'll move to the next thing. If you have questions, stop me, all right? So when I look at, when I, when I look at, uh, when I look at um, oxygen moving into the blood, I'm gonna draw a beaker of solution right here, okay? And we're gonna say that this is one liter of blood. Now, so what we have in here is we have plasma and we have red blood cells. And so in that one liter, I've got this red blood cell right here, and I've got plasma. Now, if you were to look at red blood cells, if I took one cc of blood, women have about, oh, um, what is it, 4.8 million red blood cells per cubic millimeter of blood. Um, it's, it's just jam-packed with red blood cells, all right? Men are slightly higher because of, of erythropoietin. But when oxygen moves into, um, into plasma, Oxygen comes into plasma and it dissolves itself into plasma. But as oxygen moves in, it also then moves into the red blood cell. And so what's happening is in this one liter of blood, I have about three milliliters of O2 per liter in plasma. All right. But the other thing is that when an oxygen molecule moves in, it can also go into hemoglobin. And then on hemoglobin, I have about 197 milliliters of O2 per liter on in the red blood cells, which gives me a total of 200 milliliters of O2 per liter of blood. Now, if we look at how much O2 plasma can carry, we take the three and divide it by 200, and that gives us 1.5%. So your plasma carries 1.5% of your oxygen. The red blood cell, when we divide 197 by 200, that gives us 98.5%. Um, and so now 100% of our blood is being carried in, uh, in the red blood cell and in plasma. So what we have is we need another measurement because this right here, this PaO2 of 100 milliliters of mercury gives us this measurement right here, how much is in plasma. 
We also want to measure, well, how much is being carried in the red blood cell? So some of you work as EMTs or CNAs. Clinically, if I wanted to measure how much was being carried on the red blood cell, I would measure what's called SAO2. So how do we measure SAO2? Anyone? Everybody's muted. But anybody want to take a shot at how we measure SAO2? You're all going to keep quiet, huh? Okay. So SAO2 is the saturation of the red blood cell. We put a pulse oximeter on the finger. So I put the pulse oximeter on the finger. And for those of you who work CNAs, what's a normal reading for somebody that's healthy and breathing well? Nobody's going to answer me. I Char believe it's 95. Okay, 95. Like 96 right. to 99. 96 to 99. Can we get it to 100? Yeah, just have them breathe deep. If you go into a patient's room and their, and their saturation is at 92%, no need to worry just yet. Just say, hey, could you take a deep breath? It clears out the CO2 and it can bump up to 100. So we can, get a, we can get an SAO2 reading. Thank you, by the way, for answering. We can get an SAO2 of up to 100%. So you're both correct, all right? So our normal PAO2 is 100 millimeters of mercury. If they're ventilating sufficiently, you can get to 100%. Okay, so you need to know these, these numbers for the exam, all right? Now, let's go back up here and look at, look at this. We've got one liter here, but we have five liters of blood. And by the way, when we talk about five liters of blood, we're using um, sexist research because back in the 60s, 50s, well, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, when they researched physio physiology, what they did is only um, 18 to 20 year old white college males would show up for the, for the research. And so all of this research is based upon 18 to 20 year old white college males. And so there's about, they have about five liters of blood, okay? So, um, so we're looking at five liters of blood, which means that we can, if we take five times the 200, our total carrying capacity is about 1,000 milliliters of O2 per liter, all right? We don't need all that. We only, we only need about 25% of that on a single circuit. And so we see that represented in our SAO2 because as we come back this way, our SAO2 was at 100%. But what happens is when hemoglobin gives up oxygen, it moves out here and that oxygen can displace oxygen from the plasma and the oxygen moves out and then this, then as more oxygen disassociates from hemoglobin, it can disassociate more um, oxygen from plasma. So when we're coming back this way, our SVO2, which is a percent, okay, is 75%. So we only used up 25% of our oxygen. So here's a thought question for you. How long does it take for a red blood cell to leave the heart. So here's my red blood cell. It's gonna leave the heart, it's gonna travel around and it's gonna come back into, from the um, left ventricle back into the right atrium. How long did that take? Did that circuit take? Did it take an hour, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, five? Well, we know that cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate, right? And if we look at cardiac output, we pump five liters of blood per minute, which means it only took one minute for that to take place. So if we, in one minute, we've given up 25% of our oxygen, we're still 75% saturated. Let's say that somebody is asphyxiating, okay? They can't take in oxygen. How long does it, how long do they have before they go into um, brain death, before there's no oxygen left in blood? How long does it take? That'd be about three to four minutes. Exactly, three to four minutes, because the first minute I gave up 25%. The next minute I give up a little bit, um, 
um, more than 25%, and that's because my blood is starting to acidify. And then the next circuit, I'm gonna give up um, much more than 25%. And so there's three minutes right there. And so I've got about three and a half to four minutes. Now I can get around that. Like if I'm a deep sea diver, you know, I, I, I accommodate, I adjust to that physiologically. Um, I can have these physiological adjustments that we'll look at maybe later. But um, yeah, but it, normally it takes about three to four minutes and then you're gonna go into fixation. Okay. So now we're gonna apply this information. So let's just go by and review. So things that, that you really need to know is you need to know what the partial pressure of like PATM is atmospheric oxygen. PA is alveoli, P little a is arterial, and PV is venous. And so you're gonna need to know for the exam what PaO2 is and what PaCO2 is you'll need to know what P little a O2 is and what P little a CO2 is. And you'll need to know what P V O2 is and what P V CO2 is. And you can see all that right here. The other thing that I want you to know is S V O2, okay? So if it's in the arterial side and it's good, it's anywhere from 98 to 100%, okay? And then PVO2, if it's normal, your SVO2 is going to be, whoops, SAO2 is going to be at 75%. So those are numbers that you, that you should know. All right, any questions on this stuff so far? Because I'm going to show you two more things and then give you a clinical example. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of the gas laws as it pertains to this information. Now, I've got this individual. I've got two individuals. One is down here at sea level. So here he is standing down here at sea level. Okay. Now at sea level, there is 20.9% oxygen in the atmosphere. Oxygen makes up 20.9% of the gas. The atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. But now this person is going to go up here and let's say that they're at, um, oh, let's go on top of Mount Everest. Okay, Mount Everest is 29,000 feet. All right. Now, this person down here was underneath the weight of gas because gas is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, um, uh, water, and then also a few other gases. And so what we see is we see a column of gas and that column of gas is pushing down on this individual because we know that gas has mass. We know that when the wind blows, it can blow things over because that mass is pushing through the air. Now, <clears throat> this person up here has actually come out from underneath this column of gas. So they've gone up here and so there's less pressure pushing down. However, what didn't change is this. What didn't change is they're still at 20.9% because gas is equally distributed through the atmosphere. But let's say this person up here, um, the atmospheric pressure is uh, uh, 200, okay? So if we were to do the math down here, we take, if we wanna calculate the partial pressure, here we'd go 760 times, and we're gonna move our decimal point over, so two, zero nine and that's going to equal 158.8 millimeters of mercury pressure that's the pressure of gas down here okay but now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to figure out what the partial pressure of o2 is so this is the partial pressure of oxygen so now i'm going to grab my calculator here and see what it is because i'm not going to go to my head so 200 times 0 0.209 equals, all right, so the answer is 40. Okay, so this person there, P-A-T-N, O2, is 41.9, all right, yeah, 41.8. So 41.8, all right. This person is going to be short of breath. Even though the percent's the same, they're not going to be able to breathe because look what happens is if I'm at 158.8 and I'm breathing in this oxygen, by the time it gets here, it's at 100. 
all right? But what would happen if I breathed in this oxygen? What do you think the PaO2 is gonna be? It's gonna be less than that, right? So the question is, if I get off, if someone, if a helicopter takes me off the mount, top of Mount Everest and I haven't acclimated to it, and I get off the plane and I step on, off onto the top of Mount Everest, which way does oxygen travel when I take a breath? Does oxygen go into the lungs with a, if the PA, if the PVO2 is at 40, and let's say, let's just say for, you know, I'm not gonna do the calculation, but let's say that instead of at 41.8, let's say it goes in here and it's at 10 instead of 100. Is oxygen going into the lungs or is it going out of the lungs? So if this is 40 and this is 10, oxygen moves this direction. So when you take a breath, you're not taking in oxygen, you're giving up oxygen. That's why at high altitude, if a plane depressurizes, you can't, you can't breathe, you're not breathing in oxygen. So you have to breathe in pure oxygen in order to bump up its partial pressure in order to get this back into the normal range. All right, any questions on that concept? So the key takeaways are the percent of oxygen didn't change, okay? But what changed is when we took the atmospheric pressure, the atmospheric pressure changed because we came out from underneath that column of gas. All right, I wanna look at nitrogen right here for just a second. When I look at nitrogen, nitrogen has what's called a pore solubility coefficient meaning that nitrogen, when I breathe it in, it doesn't really go into the blood. So does nitrogen serve a purpose? And what we find out is it does, because nitrogen exerts a pressure on the walls of the alveoli, because if oxygen is moving in, if we just had oxygen in the atmosphere without, without nitrogen, when oxygen moved in, the walls of the alveoli would collapse but nitrogen is a placeholder. It maintains a pressure within the alveoli so it doesn't collapse as oxygen moves in. All right, any questions? Okay, so here's our big application for today. All right, so one of the things on the exams is we need to be able to apply stuff. I'm gonna give you a clinical application that you're not responsible for and you will not see on the exam. But it's one of the things that you're gonna find in your clinicals. It's an extremely important um, concept for, for your clinical physiology. So here's what we have. We have, let me just change this back here. We have this individual and they're breathing. So the question is, and I'm gonna wait until somebody answers me. The question is, why? Why do we breathe? Why were our systems designed that we breathe in oxygen? Why do we breathe in oxygen? Anyone? Come on, Rosie, Charlie, Alanis, Brittany, Marissa, Hannah, anyone? Uh oh, people are leaving. Do we breathe in oxygen? I don't, I don't know. I feel like it should be a really simple answer, but. It is, okay, so I, I, should hear people <laughs> away. I just had people drop out. So, okay. <laughs> so here's why we breathe in oxygen. So when I, when I breathe in oxygen, here's, here's my red blood cell, okay? And so when I, I have hemoglobin right here, and so oxygen comes into the blood, okay? So here comes my oxygen. And now this oxygen right up here is gonna go into the hemoglobin, and I'm gonna form what's called oxyhemoglobin, all right? And then I'm gonna use that red blood cell to carry oxygen to the cell. And when I get to the cell, I'm gonna release that oxygen into the cell. Now here's the reason why. In the cell, so now we're going back to the last term, we have C, our actually bio bonds, okay? Because in the cell, we take in glucose because glucose is our fuel substrate. So I have C6H12O6, all right? That's glucose. 
Now, when I break down glucose, I'm going to get 2C3H4O3. Now, in order to do that, I needed to input 2 ATP, right? But I was able to get back 4 ATP, but I only netted 2. So by doing this, I get ATP. Now, if I can get oxygen in here, oxygen can go into the mitochondria and I can take oxygen into the mitochondria. Now I can take my pyruvate into the mitochondria too. And when I take it in there, I can pull off the carbon and the oxygen and form CO2. I can pull off hydrogen ions, and if I take half of an oxygen molecule and give it two hydrogen ions, I can get H2O. So what I get when I break down the glucose is I take C6, H12O6, plus 6O2, and what I get is I get 6CO2 plus 6H2O. But the question is why? Why did I breathe in that oxygen just to get CO2 and H2O? Anybody wanna take a stab at that? Well, look up here. By breaking down glucose, I got two ATP. I, I inputted two ATP and I got four back. But by taking oxygen into the cell, I not only got CO2 and H2O, but what else did I get? I got ATP. I got roughly 36 ATP depending on what process I used. So the answer to why do we breathe is to get ATP. Because ATP is important for all of your metabolic cell process, or all your metabolically active cells. Because they need ATP to run the sodium potassium ATPase pumps, to disassociate myosin from actin. Um, just all kinds of stuff is using ATP. So the reason I breathe is to get ATP. Now, if I'm not getting oxygen to the cell. So let's say that this person, let's say they're bleeding. So they're bleeding out and they're decreasing their perfusion. So if they decrease their perfusion and they're not getting oxygen here, they don't get oxygen available to produce my 36 ATP. If that happens, this molecule right here, this is called pyruvate. Here's what takes place, pyruvate, um, 2C3, H4O3 is now going to be acted upon by lactate dehydrogenase. And I'm going to make 2C3H6O3. Now, where I got these four extra hydrogen ions is up here when I took 2NAD. What I did is I gave those two hydrogen ions. So I took 2NADH. This is going back to bio bonds plus two hydrogen ions. So lactate dehydrogenase, what it does is it just grabs these back and it puts them back on pyruvic acid to make lactic acid, okay? Now, we're getting into the clinical concept. Let's say that somebody is hemorrhaging. They're losing blood. That decreases their perfusion. If they're not getting adequate oxygenation, they can't get oxygen into the cell it stops oxidative metabolism and it kicks them back into glycolytic metabolism. They still need to make ATP. So they're doing this, but as they're making ATP, they need to get rid of the pyruvate so this process will continue and they're making lactic acid. Now, lactic acid has this structure right here. When I make lactic acid, lactic acid and by the way, you are not tested on this. I'm just trying to give you the clinical application. In fact, this application right here is probably the most important clinical application or one of the most important clinical applications that keeps patients alive, okay? Because when I look at the structure of lactic acid, it's this structure right here. C, these are my carbons. Then connect to that, I have hydrogen ions. All right, and I've got, oops. I don't want a double bond, I just want a single bond. And then H, and then down here, I have an OH, and I've got a double bond there and oxygen. This is lactic acid. 
So what's going to happen is lactic acid is going to diffuse into the blood. Okay, so it's coming from here and it's diffusing into the blood. But in the blood, what happens is this, is it gives up this hydrogen ion and it goes into this form. So instead of redrawing it, let me just do it this way. So in the blood, this right here, the hydrogen ion disassociates. And what I get is this. I get an oxygen that has a negative charge plus a hydrogen ion. Okay. What takes place now is I'm going into metabolic acidosis. The reason I'm going to metabolic acidosis is because I'm acidifying the blood with hydrogen ion. All right. Your patient will tell you that that's what's taking place. They're going to tell you that that's what's taking place because their respiration is going to increase. Okay. The reason the respiration increases is because of this right here. So I'm going to go back over to the cell here. I'm going to show you something else. So when we take CO2 and H2O, all right, CO2 and H2O, so here's my CO2 and H2O. I, I, in the cell, I've formed CO2 plus H2O. CO2 is going to diffuse from the cell and it's going to enter the blood. When it enters the blood, it's going to go into the red blood cell. So in the red blood cell, I got to draw a big red blood cell here. Let me get rid of this right here. Okay. So here's my red blood cell. Here's what takes place. CO2 goes into the red blood cell and, and it's going to join with H2O. So there's CO2 plus H2O. Then I have an enzyme called um, carbonic anhydrase. That's going to give me H2CO3. And then H2CO3 gives me two things. It gives me a bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is going to diffuse out and it gives me a hydrogen ion, okay? Now the bicarbonate diffuses out into blood because my blood pH is maintained at about 7.35 to 7.45. And the res your respiratory system helps maintain that. The hydrogen ion is gonna be buffered by hemoglobin. So I form what's called um, deoxyhemoglobin. So I take my hydrogen ion, oops, I take my hydrogen ion right here, and I'm gonna give that to hemoglobin. And what happens is what's called the Bohr effect, and it splits the oxygen off, so the oxygen moves in, and then I take my hemoglobin and I buffer the, hyd the hydrogen ion. Okay, so that's all taking place in the red blood cell. But now what we're doing is we're actually putting lactate into the blood. So now we have this hydrogen ion in the blood. So here, let's put the hydrogen ion in the blood. So here's my hydrogen ion in the blood. All right. Now hydrogen, now see over here where we have this bicarbonate go out into the blood? The hydrogen will actually join with bicarbonate and it'll form H2CO3. And then it'll give me CO2 plus H2O. So what's happening is it's increasing the CO2 in the blood. Let me ask you a question. What happens when your body um, is aware of an increase in CO2? What happens to your respiratory rate? It increases. It increases. Because what you're getting is what's called hypercapnia. With an increase in CO2, we become hypercapnic, and now we're increasing our respiratory rate. So here's what your patient's telling you. Your patient's telling you that I am not perfusing my tissues. I'm making, I'm going into glycolysis. I'm making lactic acid going into metabolic acidosis. The metabolic acidosis is giving me more serum CO2. And now my respiratory rate is starting to go up. And, and, and one of the key things we're going to take away from this is that lungs respiration helps control pH. All right. 
Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited. That's a lot of chemistry, but I can't wait. Well, let's, let's, I'm going to give you one last thing. This is a nice, simple one. Awesome. We want simple. Let's just give a simple one. Okay. Okay. So here we've got the lungs and the thoracic cavity. Now the lungs, what we have is we have the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. And, and so the visceral pleura is going to line, cover the lungs. And then what happens is it reflects back on itself and the parietal pleura lines the cavity. So in here, we have this fluid filled cavity. Now, let's say my pressure outside is 760. If I'm standing with my mouth open, looking at the beach, if I'm at the beach and I have my mouth wide open, that means the air can get in and it can get out. So that means my pressure in here is at 760. The pressure is the same. But let's say I'm on the top of a mountain and the pressure is at 500 here and the pressure is at 500 here. Or let's say I'm at the top of a mountain and I have no idea what the pressure is. I can get away from these pressures and just go, let's talk about respiratory pressures. So what we do is we say that the respiratory pressure is zero. So if I'm, if I'm, no matter where I'm at, I can just say that my respiratory pressure is zero. Okay. Okay. So here I'm at zero and here I'm at zero because again, my mouth is open. Now what's going to happen though. And by the way, if my respiratory pressure is zero in here, it's at negative four. Okay. This is measured in millimeters of mercury pressure. Now this negative four is because we have fluid in here, but we also have lymphatic drainage and we're draining away this fluid. Okay. Now when I contract the diaphragm, the diaphragm, when it contracts, it's going to pull down this direction. And so when the diaphragm contracts, it's increasing the superior, inferior dimensions of the thoracic cavity. What that does is that creates a vacuum. So all of a sudden, my pressure goes to negative one here. Well, it didn't change out here. And since negative one is less than zero, air rushes inside. But the other thing that happened is because I increased the size of my chamber, this went from negative four to negative six. And Boyle's law tells me that because Boyle's law looks at this piston right here and says, Hey, I, I have this chamber and in this chamber, I have this gas. And let's say that this gas is at 500 millimeters of mercury pressure. Okay. So in this Boyle's law it says that I have this gas and it's diffusing. It, it's you know, distributed out here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure this. And when I measure it, I find that it's at 500. Okay. So the needle's at 500 here. Well, I know that if I take this and push it down, I'm compressing the molecules of gas together and it might go up to 600, right? Mm -hmm. But what would happen if I pulled the piston the other direction? It decreases. It would go down. So it goes to 400. So now we can go, well, let's look at the lungs. Let's see what happens. If we, if we um, go into the alveoli, we say that the respiratory pressure in here is at zero. So we're, our, actually in here is at negative four. Okay. So we're at negative four, but what we're going to do is when we contract the diaphragm, we're going to take it this direction because we're pulling it up. We're increasing the dimensions and it goes to negative six. All right. Now, if somebody were to come along and let's say that we created a, a wound right here. So I create this opening in here. Now, when my diaphragm contracts, I'm not only pulling air in from the atmosphere into the lungs, but air is coming into the space. And that's called a pneumothorax, okay? And so as air comes to the space, what happens is this becomes, so this goes from negative four to zero when I created that opening. And then when I pull down, it goes to negative one and my pressure right here is still zero. So every time I take a breath, it keeps collapsing. So eventually what can take place is I can completely collapse that alveoli. And this is just a cavity, cavity filled with air. And so this pneumothorax, what it can do is it can start to push the heart this way. And it can lead to heart failure, right-sided heart failure because of pulmonary hypertension and left-sided heart failure because it can actually kink the aorta. All right. So what you want to do is you want to cover that up um, uh, and not let them have that sucking chest leak. All right. So a couple last concepts is... If I want to maintain my pressures, there's pressures that collapse the lung and there's pressures that, that keep the lung open. So if I were to take two glass slides, a glass slide here and a glass slide here, and I put them together, I could 
easily separate them from one another. But when I move them along their surface, you get friction between them. However, if I were to just take a drop of water and put it in here, then I couldn't separate these, right? Because of that surface tension. And also when, when they moved against each other, there's, there's no friction. So in here we have pleural fluid, which is a serous fluid. And what it does is that surface tension keeps the visceral appended to the parietal. And so now when I increase my, the dimensions of my thoracic cavity, as the parietal pleura is pulled out, the visceral pleura comes and rides along with it. Uh -huh. so that's, that's one of the things that keeps my lungs from collapsing, okay? The other thing that keeps the lungs from collapsing is this. When I look at this pressure, zero, zero is greater than negative four. And so this pressure is actually pushing the visceral pleura up against the parietal pleura. So those are the two things that keep my lungs from collapsing. But there's also forces that want to make the lungs collapse. And so one of the forces is down here. So if I come down these airways and I go to the primary, secondary, tertiary, I'm going to get out here to the small little alveoli. And so if I look at the alveoli, in the alveoli, what I have is I have fluid in here. And the walls of the alveoli are so close together that that alveoli actually wants to take the walls and collapse the walls because it has a polar attraction. Because the water molecule, it has negative and positive charges and it wants to bead together. So it creates a surface tension in here and wants to collapse the alveoli. However, in the lungs, we have what are called type two cuboidal cells. And type two cuboidal cells make a thing called surfactant. And what surfactant does is it lines the walls and it breaks up that surface tension. And so it doesn't allow the walls to collapse. However, let's say that you have a premature baby. In the premature baby, these septal cells are not online yet, and so we're not making surfactant. And so what happens is the walls collapse. So that, so that, um, that premature infant, that neonate, you have to mechanically hold open. You're, you're under pressure, you're putting um, oxygenating the lungs and holding it open because otherwise they're going to um, collapse. Now, the other thing that makes the lungs want to collapse is elastin fibers, because we have these elastin fibers that surround the lungs. And they're kind of like, they're kind of like um, rubber bands. So they're around the alveoli, but they're also throughout the parenchymal tissue of the lungs. We have these elastic sheets. And so when we take a breath, the lungs expand, and then they have passive recoil. So the expansion is active through the action of muscle. The recoil is passive through the action of the elastin fibers. And so the elastin fibers help collapse the lungs. Now, one of the things to note is there's an enzyme produced by the liver called um, alpha trypsin. And it's alpha one um, antitrypsin. And what it does is it prevents these fibers from being broken down. Because in the lungs, you also have alveolar macrophages. And so these alveolar macrophages they're in the lungs and what they'll do is if I inhale bacteria or some biological matter and that gets down into here, you can get these chemotactic signals that call in neutrophils, eosinophils and macrophages and they will produce proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic enzymes can actually break down these elastin fibers, okay? However, um, alpha-1 antitrypsin, what it does is it prevents the breakdown of these fibers, okay? Because it, 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 it denatures these proteolytic enzymes, and so they're not active. However, smoking will deactivate alpha-1 antitrypsin. And if I deactivate alpha-1 antitrypsin, I break down the elastin fibers, and now that the lungs can't recoil, I start to get, my lungs start to get bigger and bigger and bigger because I can't exhale. Does anybody know what that pathology is called? It's a type of COPD. Anyway, it's emphysema. And so emphysema is due to smoking because you're deactivating, you're not deactivating alpha-1 antitrypsin and you're, you're, you're um, breaking down the elastic recoil of the lungs. All right, any questions on any of this stuff? So I'll tell you what, as you're studying this weekend, if you have questions, write them down. Um, and if you, if you, if you can wait till Tuesday, we'll meet again on Tuesday. Otherwise, email me over the weekend um, and I'll get back to you with, with answers.
Okay. Awesome. Questions, we'll uh, wrap it up. <laughs>